Paul Feig is Hollywood's most esteemed comedy director and writer, helming such hits as Bridesmaids, The Heat and Spy. He makes a mean martini. And he's also the best dressed man in the Western world. Paul, you've just made me laugh by talking about Jacob Rees-Mogg. And you're... <laughs> I'm trying to sit just like him right now. I'm lounging back. Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a really, f- almost a full extension back. It's sort of, but um, you say he gives double-breasted suits a, a bad name. Yeah, well, yeah, because first of all, he's known for wearing them. And yeah. he seems to be kind of a, from, from my American point of view, sort of a not-liked character. I mean, in the British public, I should say. Um and so right there, he sort of stands, you know, his suits now stand for something bad. But then they also do s- sort of hang there a little, yeah, they, slightly shapelessly, I would dare say. It's, yes, it's almost like he's, yeah, they, they just fall, don't they, off his skeleton. They just, there's no, but I don't know if I want to see his body contours. I, yeah, I was going to say, maybe, yeah, but let's be careful what we, what we are wishing for. I don't want to know what the real Jacob Rees-Mogg silhouette is. <laughs> that might be, uh, that might be too much. <laughs> Can't be unseen. No, but you're looking, as always, just dapper as all hell. Well, thank you, Sue. Thank you. Is it, have you always been drawn to the sort of, um, to the sharp and the smart? Yeah, I have, actually. I mean, when I was young, I, really young, I used to watch old movies from the 30s and 40s with my mom, you know, and you would see Cary Grant and Fred Astaire and all that. And, just, and I was like, oh, they, they look so cool. I always liked the way they looked. And then uh, Groucho Marx was my hero, when I was a kid, and um, I read a biography about him, and one of the things he said was that he never trusted a man who didn't dress well. And so I was like, well, if if Groucho says that, then I must start dressing well. And so I, pretty early on, I think I got my first three-piece suit, and I was eight or nine. No. Yes, yes. So this is in in Michigan? Yeah, in Michigan. And is it what? Is it in a big city in Michigan? Is it in the rural backwaters of Michigan? Uh, somewhere between the two. Okay. Suburban. Very suburban, exactly. So a very blue-collar neighborhood. My dad owned an army surplus store, um, you know, so he's just sold old army fatigues and sporting goods and hunting outfits and all that kind of thing. So, But he always wore a suit and tie when he went to work, but it was always like a kind of a cheap work suit, you would call it. And it was usually like a sports jacket, but they're all, you know, all completely polyester and from Sears, you know, the big department store. Um, so, I, so I got it stuck in my head that you have to dress when you go to work, but then I wanted to really be sartorial. And so I was an only child. I was very much Little Lord, <laughs> little Lord Fauntleroy. I was going to say, it is Little Lord Fauntleroy. Oh, totally. Yeah. Oh, my God. My mom just, you know, would indulge any whim I had. <laughs> I want to take guitar lessons. Okay, let's buy him a guitar. Let's take, you know, I want to be a tap dancer. Okay, here we go. And this was, you know, so this was music to our ears. So we drove... We couldn't go to our local mall. We had to drive to the fancy mall, which was across town, called the Somerset Mall, uh, which was in a more, ex- you know, uh, high, uh, more white collar uh, area. And um, went to the Somerset Mall, went to Saks Fifth Avenue, and uh, got a, a Pierre Cardin three piece suit. And you were eight? Yes, I was eight. <laughs> so my father immediately blew his top when he saw, because he's going to grow out of it in three months. And I did, but oh, what a three months they were. I was, and uh, where did you wear it? Was there no situation inappropriate for that? No, I wore that thing everywhere. But I would, I would wear it to like the grocery store to go grocery shopping with my mom. And all these, you know, you'd walk down an aisle and these women would just like look and laugh and I'm just like how oh, dare they they know nothing pearls before swine <laughs> <laughs> but I, I probably I look like a ventriloquist dummy walking around basically so all all, all kitted out <laughs> so did you get did you get bullied at school as a result or did people just accept your intrinsic idiosyncrasy oh I always got bullied <laughs> did you yes oh god well I mean I was I walked this weird line because um I was you know a comedy guy, so I was always trying to make people laugh and trying to be, um, you know, everybody's pal. And so it was, you know, very affable and had a lot of energy. I, I always got in trouble for talking too much in class, but people liked me. But then I had bullies who just despised me. It interests me that that even though you knew that you were the subject of bullying, that you you put the target on your own back. Oh, you, yeah. you wanted to be bullied on your own terms yeah. because you looked good. <laughs> I know exactly. You know, I mean, it's it, it's it's something I've kind of lived by, which is. I, I, I want to play it safe all the time and kind of not create controversy. But at the same time, I don't want to not 
be who I am, you know, and I, and, and so it was always that thing of like, should I do this? Should I not? And it was just like, just do it. I, I, I'm that way, you know, in life now. Yeah. It's kind of even, you know, something's like, oh, I know I'm going to cr- create a lot of, <laughs> attract a lot of attention if I wear this today. But it's like, yeah, but isn't it better to... Tell the world who you are. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But that seems to be part of the comic, the weird sort of particle in a wave that makes up the comic identity. You want to yeah. sort of be yourself, be authentic, voice your own experience. But you're also, by dint of your job, a people pleaser, aren't you? You're a chameleon. You want yeah. to kind of get as many people on board yeah. with that vision and that 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 way as yeah. possible. Yeah. Well, that, I would you know, say as a, as a comedy person, all we want to do is be laughed with but our worst nightmare is being laughed at. And, you know, it really is true, because if we're controlling the laugh, that's what we're doing, so we're trying to people please that way. Mm -hmm. But then if suddenly, you know, somebody laughs at you. I mean, I was, the most devastating sound for a young male nerd is the uncontrollable laughter of of girls, because you always assume they're laughing at you. And, oh, and you know, and a lot, of, and a lot of times it would be that too. But it's some, it's some weird primal thing with like nerdy dudes. If you hear, if you're in like a, to this day, if I hear like you know, a group of women just go like un, just something that where they can't stop laughing, it just it, you're like, oh my god, they're laughing at me. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. It, it's kind of hardwired into and the brain of a geek. That, that then you've you, you've you've made this extraordinary career in part out of giving women the potential to have people laugh at them, you know. And mm-hmm. it, it's a it's a complex brother, isn't it? Yeah, it Cause is. Because not laughing at them, they're laughing with them at their brilliance, yeah. at, their, at their skill. Yeah, well, you know, that's, I mean, what what's the worst kind of insult that can happen to a comedy person is if you make a joke and somebody goes, ha, 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 and that, but then they give you the look of, like, that wasn't funny. And yeah. It's like, oh, it's so gutting. I'm like, oh, my God, like, you're using laughter against me, like, you know. For me, it's... It's the same, but in reverse. So if even now, as, as a nerdy sort of awkward child inside, if I hear groups of men laughing, I, I yeah. never assume they're laughing in conjunction with me. Yeah, yeah. And I, I might be completely wrong, and I, I do fight that all the time. It's like, they're laughing about something else. Get over yourself. See, You're not the centre of everyone's world. That's exactly it. But it, it is that, I guess it's our mentality of like, we're so used to kind of controlling the laughter in yeah. a situation that when it becomes uncontrollable, it does, it triggers something in your brain that goes, oh my God, this, it's all pointed at me. Yeah, and then you feel like, well, what kind of ego do I have? Like, you know, they don't even know I'm sitting here. Again, it's that thing of wanting to be the same as everyone else and wanting to be different yeah. at the same time. It's like you don't want people laughing at you because laughter is the, is them pointing out your... Mm-hmm. The, the fact you're not like everyone else in their class, yeah. and yet in your in your situation, you're you're willfully attracting that and co-opting it by wearing a three piece suit at the, at the age of eight. Yes, exactly. Well, I mean, but don't you think that's why we all became funny back way back when? Still a work in progress, yeah. people. Really, <laughs> still very much working on that. Jury's out on me, trust me. <laughs> no, uh, no. But um, no, but I, just because of that, because you go like, I'm going into a situation. And you just kind of like, they're going to laugh at me unless I take control of it and give them something to laugh at that I, I am saying, I approve of you laughing at this. Yeah. You know? I'm going to set, I'm going to try and set the rules. Yes, exactly. Because I, I was so woefully incapable of doing that when I was a kid or a teenager. Mm-hmm. I mean, everything when you're a teenager is just about, it's just a riot of hormones. And it's yeah. like, I don't, I don't want to be part of this cattle market. And yet I so, I am. And I don't, and I'm, and I'm not winning. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm not the bell of the bull. I'm not going to anyone's prom. I'm not, I'm not that kind of kid. Yeah. But I, and I, and I sort of want to be. So you develop, yeah, like you did, you develop other skills. You try and make people laugh and you try and connect. I don't know about you, I connected lots of groups. So I was oh. never, f- were you fully a nerd or were you in the bit of everyone's game? I, I was kind of a bit of everyone's yeah, thing. We were yeah. very, you know, we were, I don't know. It's funny. When when I was creating Freaks and Geeks, I, I really was having a hard time figuring out, like, well, what are the geeks? Because I know what we were. We, we had nerds in our school. We had a couple, like, hardcore nerds, like, who, you know, walked around with briefcases, and they were really weird. Kind of Lego heads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just, like, weirdos, <laughs> you know. And so we were like, okay, we're not them, you know. But then... If anything, I think we were just awkward. We were just like awkward and and underdeveloped mentally. I think so, like emo. I suppose you'd be what's called emo e kids now. That kind of yeah, not quite as I gothic mean, maybe, but yeah. I don't think we were as, as thoughtful as that. I mean, honestly, our only goal in life was to get to lunch the lunch table so we could just 
recreate <laughs> lines from Bugs Bunny cartoons. I mean, we, that's all we did for years. We would just sit around and just act out our favorite lines from Bugs Bunny cartoons. It was crazy, I, you know. <laughs> and then Monty Python, you know, eventually, and all that kind of thing. But that was that was it for us, uh, you know. I mean, and 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 just then going like, oh, and please don't let anybody beat us up, <laughs> you know. And, and and so we had no deep thoughts whatsoever, honestly, and, and didn't date. You know, we're terrified of dating. I, I went on two dates in in high school. One was I took a girl to the to the Christmas dance when I was a sophomore, and it was a disaster. She was a girl who remember there's always a. Do you ever have the, there's always some couple that were just making out constantly. They were yes. like the couple, yeah, and they were so free with their public displays of affection. And this girl was part of one of those. <clears throat> and so for a year and a half, I was just like wow, you know. And then she broke up with this the guy, yeah. And so I kind of swept in and went like, <laughs> hey, do you want to go to the dance? Thinking like I was now going to become part of this PDA extravaganza, and. Um, but clearly, I didn't want that, you know. No. I would not be comfortable doing that. But I kind of thought, oh, so so I took her to the, the dance. And I she was always really pretty, but she was kind of soft and looked just like a normal girl, you know. And when I went to pick her up to go to the this dance, she had done, like, crusted with makeup and done her hair up in this, like, World War One. <laughs> Kind like of a helmet. helmet, yeah, totally. <laughs> it like it like a UFO was, a, and it was just like, ah, like it was so unappealing to me because it was just like, who, who are you? What, I, what happened to the nice, you know, yeah. sort of soft girl next door? You know, and and then she proceeded to get drunk on the way because we went with with friends of hers, drove. And the minute we got in the car, they like crack open beers, and they're like, "Hey!" And I'm just like, oh. "You know, for me, it was so taboo, <laughs> you know." And then she immediately downs a beer. She's like, "Oh my god, do I need that?" And downs it, which I'm immediately going like, "Well, fuck you! <laughs> like, you really? Is this so hard? You have to drink yourself into this? Situation? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, I can't believe I agreed to go with this guy." <laughs> and then she got really drunk, and um, and then halfway through the dance, her the girl that drove us, um, she comes out. She goes like. Karen's really, she's really sick. She's in the bathroom and she's so sorry, you know, and she's throwing up. And I was just like, oh, God. Uh, how am I supposed to? And the, the whole goal was I was going to make out with this girl. It was like, uh, now she's throwing up. So I don't want to She's got a World War One helmet on. Yeah. She's throwing up. <laughs> exactly. So then she comes back out all contrite and sad. And her dress is wet. So clearly they were got vomit off her dress. And she's like, oh. And so she wants to slow dance. I'm slow dancing. Like, oh, God. I can kind of smell the vomit. <laughs> And then we go out to dinner afterward, and then we pull up, and then she wants something. Oh, it's like, oh, so I did the, like, my first French kiss was awful. Just awful. I mean, first of all, we pull up in the driveway of my house, and her friends are in the front, so they immediately start making out, you know. And, and I can see my father through the through, through the uh, gap in the curtains watching TV. Your first, your first proper kiss, you could see your dad yes, as you were doing it. my father sitting oh, in his man. reclining chair watching TV. Fro you'd never leave Freudian therapy if you no, started now. No, exactly. I'm telling you, I can't even begin to start it because I would never <laughs> no. leave there. So, yeah, so then she kind of leaned, and I was just like, I got, I, this has to happen or I can't get out of this car, so... Yeah, my first French kiss was awful because I didn't know how to do it. And I just, like, literally shoved my tongue in her <laughs> mouth and made contact with her top teeth and ran my tongue all the way around her teeth, <laughs> top and bottoms. So basically, like, her pukey cleaned teeth. her teeth, her pukey <laughs> teeth, and then pulled back. And I remember she had this look on her face, like, like yeah. I, I was either, like, it was either the greatest kiss ever or the most horrific moment of her life because it was an awful moment for me. I was like, all right, good night. And they ran out and then. Did oh. you ever see her again? Uh, only in school. I never went out with her again. Though. What's interesting to me though is is is, is that if she's that battle armor, that that she's scared. You know, that's that she's she's nervous. Oh, totally. So this this narrative of just like, oh God, it's all me and my bad, and you know, it's, she's she's probably thinking the same. She's she's freaked out. She's scared. She's it's a new person. It's I a guess, new, yeah. yeah, and she's and. And she's under all that peer pressure to put on all the makeup and helmet helmetize the hair and. <laughs> I remember, see, I remember going as a teenager and that would just be the, 
alcohol such a legal, beautiful way to mitigate shyness, isn't yes. it? Yes. Oh, yes. Totally. I, to, to this day. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did it. I enjoyed it too much. I got to the stage where yeah. I drank my way so intensively through college, I managed to get a lot of stomach ulcers. But mm. I think if I hadn't, I'd still be mm. in that haze because it's just, it's wonderful, isn't it? You oh, can, totally. You can be fearless when you're dating. You can be fearless in relationships, at work. Oh, no, totally. All the anxiety She just overdid away. it. Yeah, yeah. Well, she I mean, just... I, I'm still that way. I mean, I, if I get to a, when I get to a party, it's like I, somebody hand me a drink because if I don't, I get too... Ah. I can't start conversations, you know. I just get very like the minute I get in a conversation, I'm like, how do I get, how do I end this, <laughs> you know? And not not like I'm not enjoying it. It's more like how do I, I'm going to hit a point where I've run out of things to say, or I'm going to become not interesting, or I'm just going to drone or whatever. And so it's. But like, maybe the thing is, if you if the conversation runs drift, maybe it's them that's not interesting. Well, no, see, I, but I would never dare think that. That's always. But I remember meeting you, and I remember you were dressed impeccably as usual. <laughs> And, um, yeah, you weren't, I don't think you were talking to anybody and we just sort of got chatting and... Yeah, yeah. But you probably looked at me and thought, God, there's somebody who's not, just looks socially awkward. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, no, but I was, I, I, I was immediately drawn to you because you're just so great and funny and, and I just, I, you, some, you know, when you meet somebody, you go like, I know I'm going to have a lot in common with that person. It's going to be fun to talk to them. That was, that was you, Sue. Well, I just thought there's an old soul. <laughs> in a in a, with a with a fresh face, um, <laughs> in a really dumb sense of humor. <laughs> Dear listeners, the state of the world, well, it's pretty abysmal right now. But I think I found a bit of light relief that we all need. The Secret Diary of Boris Johnson, aged thirteen and a quarter, is out now in all good bookshops. This tells the story of how Alexander Boris de Feffel Johnson. Man of the people, a lazy, bumptious, entitled, and overweening child, comes to decide that he should be prime minister. Along the way, we see him hone this technique and the persona that will one day allow him to hoodwink an entire nation. Author and comedy writer Lucien Young wields his satirical pen like a sword to expose and ridicule Boris's stupidity, abuses, and vices. The audiobook is read brilliantly by impressionist John Culshaw. I'll leave you with a gem of wisdom from 13-year-old Boris. Remember, it's not lying if you don't bother to learn the truth. The Secret Diary of Boris Johnson, aged 13 and a quarter, is out now in hardbook, ebook, and of course audiobook. I kind of guess, I mean, this is more a formal question, which seems weird as we know each other, but I really want to know what the first film you saw was. Do you remember it? I mean, just at any... Yeah, I mean, I wonder whether... You, maybe at the movie theatre. Maybe when... A, a film yeah. that was like an event. Your first, like... Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, short of seeing a Winnie the Pooh cartoon, which I thought was fantastic. Oh. But, but it came on before a movie called Robin and the Seven Hoods, which was a, a Rat Pack movie with Sammy Davis Jr. and okay. all them. And that immediately had some opening dance number where Sammy Davis Jr. is firing a machine gun and I started crying and had to be taken out of the theater. No. So, yes. <laughs> because you didn't like the violence. I didn't like I didn't like noise. Like, thunder and loud noises would just, like, really put me off. And how old would you have been? Oh, God, what was I for that? I was probably, like, five or six, I think. But I remember the, the first movie experience, like, real movie experience, I think was when I got taken to see 2001, a space odyssey by my father and my parents because it was that was back when movies were like a movie like that was such an event yeah and it, it played at like the detroit institute of arts and this big thing but so we got in there and but it was all it was all like, like hippie everybody was high you know you didn't realize that was the thing you were supposed to go to get high and go to so there with my parents watching you know 2001 and i love sci-fi so i was like I thought it was really cool, but then it just scared the shit out of me from the very beginning because the thing with the the apes and all the money, yeah. you know, they kill the one ape and all that, and it was just like, so that freaked me out. But then there's like spaceships, so I was like, okay, cool. So I kind of kind of enjoyed that, but also the story was sort of off-putting, and then when the guy, you know, floats away and dies, I'm just like, that was off-putting. But then that whole ending with he's an old man and then the the baby, just like... What's going I remember, on? I was so traumatized by that movie. And it, How old were you that in that one? I God, again, I think I was like seven, maybe. I'm trying to think. Oh, when that... I mean, that's super young to be watching that. I mean, yeah, my parents always wanted to kind of expose me to things, and sometimes it was good, and sometimes it was, you know, it was like ill, ill, ill conceived because I was, I was just such a, such a baby. Really, I mean, I just everything scared me back then. I wouldn't, 
I was just scared of everything and I wouldn't eat anything and all that stuff. That's, that's, so that's now I'm so, I'm so intolerant of people who are scared of stuff and who don't eat <laughs> because it's like I was the worst and I got over it, you know. So I'm now I, I, it's, it, it's very judgmental. I have, I have a real Why didn't you eat? Prejudice. Can you work out why that was? I just didn't. Well, were you fussy? Do you mean you were a fussy eater? I was a fussy eater, yeah. Well, one of the things was that <laughs> when, where I grew up, especially in the, in the you know, I, I was born in 62, so 60s and 70s was basically my, my time to become a person. Um, food was not great, you know, if you really think about it. It was lots of stuff coming out of cans, lots of frozen food, lots of fried food, lots, you know. And, and so in the part of Michigan where I grew up, food had no flavor. And... I was always being told that something was great. And I had my, my grandmother on my father's side um, was the world's worst cook. Um, but she was always presented to me as the world's best cook. And so my, they'd always be like, your grandmother's chicken soup is the best chicken soup in the world. And I would eat this and it had no taste. Literally, it was flavorless. And like, so, I don't know how she did it. Got just flavor, nothing. And so, but so as a kid, you're eating going like, well, this, this is the best that food can be. I don't like it. So I guess I just don't like food, you know? And so yeah. then just eating was always just kind of a chore um, because you just knew you had to do it. And then my mom was a bad cook too. And, and so, you know, she had a couple things she made that were good. She made like this beef stew that was good. And that, you know, considering the, the, the blandness of everything else around me, that had some flavor to it. But even that was kind of like, all right, you know, it, it wasn't until I used to say Mexican food saved my life. Yeah. Because they, some Mexican restaurant opened at the local mall called Chi-Chi's. And we went there and they brought out, you know, a, a salsa and chips before we started. And it just like my head exploded. <laughs> because like, it can taste like stuff. It can taste, food can taste good. It's amazing, isn't it? When someone turns the color up on mm -hmm. your life. Mm -hmm. I, I too came from a very sort of suburban, gray part of sort of Southeast London. Mm -hmm. And exactly the same, the food in the 70s, just brown, brown, yeah. brown endless. Yeah, and I remember eating my first avocado and just being, what is it? Is it a fruit? Is it a vegetable? Where does it come from? I know it's green. This? Yeah, it's 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 extraordinary, isn't it? Like just one one Mexican restaurant can just turn the dial. Oh yeah, well that, I, I'm I'm such a I'm such a fan of religious moments. You know, because we have them. That's what forms are, you know, and it has nothing to do with religion. It forms who we are, those moments when you go like, oh, my God. You know, it, it, whether it's food, whether it's a movie, whether it's a book, whether it's, you know, a person you meet or, or a class you're in or something like that. And you, we remember those things. And to me, those are like, th those moments just are, they form who we are. I mean, I spend so much time, I think, unconsciously chasing after the things that changed my life in, in, in one way or another and trying to recreate them or trying to, you know, recreate that experience for somebody else. And, and uh, it's just, you know, it, it's this kind of butterfly you chase around your whole career. So, it's to, so is that what you feel your movies are in an attempt to make people feel that trill of delight? Yeah, yeah, they really Multi -sensory are. Multi-sensory kind of... Yeah, I, I think my, you know, the, the big religious moments in my life movie-wise <clears throat> were... When I got taken, when they re-released uh, the Marx Brothers movie Animal Crackers uh, in theaters, and my mom took me, and the, it was an afternoon screening, and the place was absolutely full, this giant theater uh, in Michigan, uh, with college students. And they went crazy because every it, all the joke, but did, they got every joke, everything killed. Even when you know they, somebody would sing a song, they they would have fun with that and laughing. At it. And I was just like, oh my god, listen, listen to what. You know Groucho and the, these guys with this kind of mayhem they're doing on screen. Look, look what it's it's yeah. doing, and and these and these people are smart, and so they're getting like the second layers of the jokes and all that. And you go, oh, so a joke can be smart and silly at the same time, and so that was a big deal for me. Um, then when I was a tour guide at Universal Studios, um, when I was about seventeen years old, I moved out to L.A. and we went to see the opening show of of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Ugh. You know, and I had no idea what was, because this is back when you weren't inundated by like lots of trailers and, and you yeah. know, you didn't know anything about it. So I didn't know anything about this thing other than I liked Harrison Ford, you know, from, from Star Wars and that was about it. So yeah, sitting in that theater, packed theater, the Man Chinese, 
Oh, and first right. show out, nobody ever seen anything. So that whole thing in the beginning, now that it's so iconic, and we've seen it a million times with the boulder rolling down after him when he turns and runs away from it. When that came on, I've never to this day seen an audience go crazy like that. that people literally, the whole theater, people jumped up and they were screaming and yelling and stuff. And and I'm just like, oh my god, that's the first time I figured out what a director can do. You know, because with, okay. with the Marsh Brothers, it's like, oh, that's what a performer can do. And a do. script and a, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And relationships on yeah. screen. They're just, he's funny. You know, like I saw Close Encounters and it wasn't a movie to me. It was like, I want to be taken away by a UFO. You know, that was, I didn't process how a movie is made. That was, But Raiders was when I was like, that's what a director can do. And that, right after that, I, I, I apply, I found out like, you know, Where's a film school? And I, you know, I applied to USC Film School and got in, and that's that really started it all for me. You, t- I mean, you sort of said, "Oh, when I moved to 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 Hollywood." I mean, you were young. I mean, if you say you were at Universal Studios by seventeen, yeah. When did you did your parents come with you, or did you just go? I'm off. No, I went. It was basically I I had graduated a little bit early from high school, and um, and so I did my. First year of college at, at a place called Wayne State University, which was in Detroit, so I could live at home because I was afraid of moving into a dorm and all that stuff. I don't know why. Uh, I just thought it was going to be people going to beat me up. I, I was just trying to avoid getting beaten up, basically. Uh, I'd love to see you in a three-piece suit in a dorm. You know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like a hostel. There he is. Like, yeah. exactly. right. Your lawyer is here, right? <laughs> But, but I, so I, I, had, I had done my, my freshman year of, of college and I just it was starting to think about wanting to be an actor and wanting to, you know, make it, you know, I just wanted to get into showbiz. And so uh, found out that Universal Studios was, was auditioning for tour guides. I basically called, I called, what I did is I called every studio in Hollywood asking if they needed actors. <laughs> it was called like the main number, you know, and they're like, uh, do you need any actors? And I'm like, well, no, we need CPAs. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm not a CPA. But I finally, the last one I called was Universal. And they're like, well, we're auditioning for tour guides. And I had taken the tour as a kid. Mm. And so I was just like, oh my God. So, but they said it's it's in two days. So I was like, what? And so I had to finish my last final exam, got my next door neighbor. We got in my car and we drove straight through where I would sleep and he would drive and then he would sleep and I would drive and got there just in time to to do the do the audition and I got accepted into the training program. But they said, the, I had a really bad acne back then. They said, we're going to put you in the training program, but you have to promise that you're going to lay out in the sun every day and try to get some color and try to get rid of your horrendous zits. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, sure, whatever. So me laying out, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm basically clear. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I have no, no, no tint to myself whatsoever. And yeah, there's a, tran- a sort of Scottish translucency. Oh, yes. Oh, I know. And I've just spent two weeks in, in Italy, so I've got this really uncomfortable kind of color right now. It's just my body's going like, why is this happening? You know what I mean? It's like it goes red for a while. It's yeah. Like, there's a, you capture a little bit of radiation yes. and then the body will just release it back red, to the... Red, pink, and white. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and then I then I was a I, I did it for a year. I not a year. I did it for a summer, and then I went back to Michigan to do my my sophomore year of college. But I had already applied to USC Film School, yeah. and then got 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 accepted, and then I moved back and never left. But right, it interests me that the Raiders was the thing. I, yeah. I I think of you're right. There's there's a moment where you something so uh, extraordinary happens in a film when you're of a certain age, when you're young, when mm. you're form in your formative years. Yeah. Um, that you look around because you ca- you can't believe the rest of the audience's response. For me, it yeah. was weirdly not a film I'm hugely in now, but um, <laughs> the second Terminator when they had oh, yeah. Arnie as a as a good guy. Yeah, and there's that scene where she's scrabbling backwards down the corridors of a of a mental hospital, mm. and he turns the corner, and the whole I just remember the whole audience going, "She's dead now." Yeah, she's so dead. Yeah, and in a, in a modern in a modern landscape that would never happen because the trailer would have given everything away. Yeah, exactly. And you'd have seen the trailer every time you open your laptop or your iPad. Mm-hmm. Whereas, unless you were a regular moviegoer, uh, we couldn't really afford to be regular moviegoers at the time. Yeah. You, you wouldn't have had. You know any intel really as to what what the what the thing was? Well, that's a problem. I mean, that's the the big thing we always grapple with, and you know, in my business is just like I want people to have a pure experience, but you got to get them to come see the movie. Yeah, <laughs> you know, because we do test screenings. You know, and those are my favorite things to do because 
the audience comes in, other than, you know, when they recruit audience members out in front of, of theaters, they're like, okay, here's the log line for the movie, you know, so-and-so. So you give them a single, like a strap line. For, yeah. yeah, so they kind of know the genre and they know who's in it and they, that's it, but that's all they get. And so that's the only time you have a pure experience with an audience because they're just like, it's just un unfolding in front of them and they have no preconceived notion. And it's great because then you get a great read on it. But then you always have to kind of, it's funny, it's we, we, movies are just built around that pure experience. But then un until years later when somebody just runs across something on TV, nobody goes to a movie with a pure, for, and has a pure experience anymore. Because yeah. they've got preconceived notions, they've seen a bunch of trailers, they've tried to figure out what it is from the trailer, they've either been fooled by the trailer and, and think it's going to be something else and are either let down because it's like, hey, I thought it was going to be this and that's not what it is, or... Or they're pleasantly surprised and it's better than they thought it would be. But they just bring in all these preconceived notions and you're just kind of, as a filmmaker, you're always like, ah, shit, I wish they didn't know that yeah. that joke was coming. I wish they didn't know that this thing was coming. You yeah, know. they do spaff a lot of good jokes on trailers now. Yeah, well, what, I mean, what I always have done with my movies is we shoot so many alternate jokes that we tend, I always tend to say, like, put in all the jokes that aren't in the movie. <laughs> so I, oh, that's great. Right when we're, I have a, a deal with marketing, like, as we're shooting, I just feed everything we're shooting to marketing. Because a lot of times filmmakers are like, yeah, they can't see it till I control it. It's like, give them everything, <laughs> you know, because they'll start, they'll start pulling out jokes. And a lot of times they'll send me kind of early trailers and stuff and they'll find jokes that I didn't even think we had or forgot about. I was like, oh, cool, that's great. And then it's like, okay, well, you keep that and we're going to put it in the movie or, you know, or, or let's trade that or just use that for the movie. And so that's what's really fun is like if people think they know all the jokes and then they show up. But then sometimes they're like, oh, what happened to that joke? I was I was looking forward to that thing. So <laughs> yeah, bro. you can't keep everybody happy. I've just thought there's an image in my head which is now really making me laugh, which is thinking about your experience kissing a girl who's been cleaning, basically being the dental hygienist yes. of a vomiting <laughs> teenager. It makes me think, of course, of bridesmaids, of, of vomiting... Of, yes. it, of, of, cabal of vomiting women <laughs> yes exactly. and you've, you've, it, you've ended up sort of it all comes full circle uh, yeah <laughs> it's strange that isn't it that, it's, <laughs> that this smash hit features women who've just gone out got blind drunk who I suppose they're not copping off they're, they're celebrating a sort of you know an imminent union but yeah exactly. well I mean for us that, that scene was always it, it was the, the catalyst of it is what how do you handle when you've made a mistake and in, in the face of overwhelming evidence, you pretend that it didn't happen. You double down. Yeah, exactly. British politics in a nutshell. Yeah, there you say. go. Yes, exactly. <laughs> American too these days. Oh, God. <laughs> but, you know, so that just was funny to us of like, you know, she doesn't have money. She's trying to compete with this woman who's got more money than her and is more everything than she is. And so she takes somebody to like a shitty restaurant, passes up it like it's a great restaurant. And then everybody gets food poisoning from it. But... Her thing is like everybody's fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. You know, and, and then, then the the comedy comes from the overwhelming evidence of like no, clearly nobody's fine. They're shitting in sinks and they're throwing up on each other's heads, <laughs> taking a dump in the street. You know, you know, but to me, the whole that scene, the the glue of that scene is Kristen and and uh, and Rose Burns standoff. Yes. where she's not going to throw up and she's sweating and you know the sweat is. We've just talked about this before the. <laughs> The increased amount of sweat yes. on Kristen's face <laughs> yes. destroys me every time I see it. That's the genius of Kristen Wiig. I mean, she was just like, she, you know, we were doing it. She goes like, hand me that can. So we had that little Evian, you know, spray can or whatever, uh, moisturizer. And she just would, she'd say one line and then she'd take the thing and spritz, put your face once, put it down, <laughs> say the next line. put So then each time we cut back, it was just wet. And it was, oh my God, she's, she is, she's a genius. <laughs> she is a genius. Um, <laughs> I mean, let, let's talk about that. How how that happened? I know you, uh, after Freaks and Geeks, and you know, which Time Magazine listed as one of the top one hundred TV shows of all time. Yeah, I know it's fantastic, but, yeah. but it's that that can be sort of scant comfort because at the time, <laughs> you know, you were treated pretty poorly. You know, it got one season, and they yeah they canned it. Yeah, no, we were we were definitely the uh, you know the, the bastard child of that network. It, it was just a it was our timing was really bad because. Um, game shows had just taken off. Um, who wants to be a millionaire? Thank you, Britain, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for that. You screwed freaks and geeks. <laughs> yeah, you know, that totally did. I mean, because that was you know all the networks were seeing that their top rated show, the top rated show on TV, cost 
a fraction of what yeah. you know doing a dramatic show would be. And so you know, it, you know, in in everyone's defense. Our show was always one of the lowest rated shows on NBC. Um, but they should be, I mean, I suppose now it's easier, but there, there should always be uh, a, a sort of a, a broad ecosystem where different things can flourish at the same time. Yeah, it, 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 it's a little different today because the minute they started putting out shows on like box sets and DVDs, like a season out, yeah, you could, you, you could get another season if you were really well received. Critically received, and we were—I mean, we were really critically received, fantastically. It, it was crazy, uh, and so that normally would have gotten us to another season. But this was before they were doing that. I was—I, you know, I've been coming to the UK for years and years and years, and I was always obsessed with the way that the Brits would do it because, you know, you'd have it, you could—I could go to uh, HMV or whatever it was at mm. the time, and. I could buy any TV series I wanted. You know, we, I used to come back with mountains of videotapes, you know, and just catch up on all these British shows. And I was just like, why don't we do that in the states? Why don't we have access to that? Because it, but it was because they all wanted to just get to a point where they could syndicate the shows, mm. and they'd make all the money by then running, you know, reruns and all this thing. So they never did it. And so when Freaks and Geeks got canceled, it was one of these shows. Everybody said, like, I hear that show's great. And it's like, well, yeah, but it's gone now, so... There's no way of seeing it. You can't see it. You can't see it. No, and so that was this devastating thing when we got canceled. Like, we did this, I considered it, you know, really fine work, Mm. and now it just doesn't exist anymore. Fine work that broke, you know, new talent, fresh new talent, uh, that had a real take on that awkward adolescent, painful adolescent experience. Yeah, yeah. And then you, it's sort of... What happened after that? Because I suppose the next thing that people would remember you for, if you were look, if you were going on a pure like hardcore IMDb vibe, Do it, would be like maybe maybe bridesmaids. Bridesmaids, or something. yeah, that was the next thing that kind of made a splash. I, so I, there's like a ten year intervening gap, isn't there, or something? What's oh, the, yeah. What's the, okay? So what happens there to? I the impeccably dressed Paul Feig in, <laughs> in Hollywood. <laughs> well, I was. It's funny after after Freaks and Geeks, it was kind of it was so well received that in the industry, everybody was like wanted to do my next thing, you know. So it was just like, what do you have? What do you have? So <clears throat> I went around pitching. You know, I, I pitched this show called Ludlow Residence, which was based on the. I grew up next to a family of eight kids, and I was an only child. And they were my best friends, and so I thought, oh, I want to do my take on a big family show, and so wrote this. And and there was kind of a bidding war over it and then Fox picked it up uh Fox Network but then it just kind of languished and and um they didn't end up making it I was really proud I I was really happy with it um but they just didn't want to do it for whatever reason and then I was just trying to develop and kind of couldn't get anything made and so I just started directing TV because I I had gotten a call um, from our line producer from Freaks and Geeks, he was working on Arrested Development. And he said, they really like you over here if you want to direct one. So I went in and, you know, lucky because it's a brilliant show. So I started doing that and I just started directing television, which was fun. It was good for me because since I had run, you know, since I had created Freaks and Geeks and had, you know, run it with Judd, I wasn't just like a TV director. So I was, I would get the extra thing of any show I'd work on. They kind of like, oh, you know, come into the writer's room. They, I could have input on the script a little bit more, not a ton, but more than most TV directors. You just show up and you just, yeah, kinda, you just here's your script, yeah. do, do it. Um, so, so it was nice. It was really good. But I always referred to the, 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 that 10 years of my life as running down the clock. Because I was like, because I had, I had made this movie, <laughs> in, in that time I made a movie called I Am David, which was hugely unsuccessful. I mean, <laughs> like, it cratered. I think it got released, <laughs> it got released here, I think it made 6,000 pounds here. Whoa. Yeah, I mean, just awful. I mean, and, and I'm proud of, you know, you love all your babies. And, yeah. And, but it was more of a drama about a kid growing up in a communist labor camp and he has to escape and get All across the laws. Europe. Yeah, so I mean, laws. exactly. <laughs> but it was based on a book that I was told was every kid in, in all of Europe had read in school called I Am David or, uh, by Anne Holm. I mean, I I've heard of it. quickly I found out it. that it seems that nobody read the book. 6,000 people have read it. That's, that's, that's <laughs> yeah, what we know now. He's paid a pound. <laughs> show up. The, your achievement is we've isolated the readers of that primary <laughs> text. <laughs> We got one one theater they're all going to be in and then take your movie and get out of here. So oh, that had bombed and then I made another movie in, in within that 10-year period called Unaccompanied Minors, which mm. was a Christmas movie, ironically, since I just made a Christmas movie. Mm. Um, and that bombed too. And so I was in what is called movie jail, uh, which means you can't, nobody's going to hire you to make a movie. How many bombs before you get to movie jail? Uh, for me, well, one studio. 
Yeah, because my the, I am David kind of didn't quite count on my ledger because it was it was an indie and, and sort of all housey and yeah, yeah. It flew under the radar. But this one was you know it was a big Warner Brothers thing and it didn't make money and so yeah, so that was it and um, yeah, and then so I was just yeah I, I, I would I just would go I'm kind of just running down the clock. I'm working look I was working on some of the greatest shows. I mean The American Office, Arrested Development, Mad Men, Thirty Rock, all these you know I directed on all these really great shows, Nurse Jackie, but it wasn't mine, you know. And so I did a really good job I felt it, you know, directing other people's stuff, but it was just like I'm not telling my stories and I'm not getting to do the stuff I want to do. And it was really when like okay, I'm just going to kind of I'll make enough money to live on doing this and then I'll be old and I'll die. <laughs> you know, my wife and I have a nice life and all that uh so when when bridesmaids popped up and it was really judd you know i mean you know judd we knew each other because of freaks and geeks mm-hmm. obviously and you know he sought me out because he knew i loved you know working with women and, and having female characters and all that and telling these stories and so you know he called me and had me come to a table read of that but it was like three years before it actually got made and i was just finishing up on a company of minors um it was was it was, it was yet to bomb um and Went to this table read, and here's all these great women at this table. It wasn't even the cast that we have, but Melissa was there. I didn't oh, even okay. know Melissa at the time. She was reading so a she, different part. Oh, was she? Yeah, yeah. She was just kind of like a utility player at this read. And um, But I'm just going, oh, God, this here's look, here's a chance. You know, the script needed a ton of work, but, like, here's a chance to have, you can put all these funny women into a new movie. And to get on the ground. Yeah. But then it just kind of went away. It was like, Judd, you know, he, I was busy with my movie, and he wanted me to shepherd the script, but, you know, kind of for no money. And I was like, I, I can't do it now. But I, I, we gave notes. I was like, just keep me in mind for it. And then three years later, it suddenly popped up out of, out of the blue. And um, Kristen was nice, and you know, I went and talked to Kristen, and she was nice enough to want me to do it too. And uh, you know, then we did it, and it just it just changed everything. And how? I mean, the script had presumably have gone through various evolutions. How much further work did you all do on as a cast we, and a crew? We did a lot because it, it actually had it hadn't changed a ton from from the the three years prior. They had kind of done back and forth and stuff, and some other people had come come uh, gotten involved and left. Um, so it was really you know Kristen and Annie and myself and Judd and we had a few other writers who kind of you know, had a room going and, and Kristen was was off in New York doing Saturday Night Live but Annie Mumolo was with us and so we were kind of all working on stuff and then she would send it back to Kristen and then they they would work on it and send it. so it, it was it was an intense kind of three three or four months of just really being hard on the script. Um, you know, but always making sure that it was running, running through Kristen and Annie's, uh, you know, typewriters, and and yeah. So, but you know, when we went into production, we had we had a lot of we had a lot of script. <laughs> and did you get? I mean, we've talked a lot um, about the the kind of incel disapproval at women kind of w- yeah. women <laughs> kind of owning and and kind of anchoring <laughs> movies. But I don't know. You don't see your films quite rightly as sort of female movies mm. but but did you as you were making bridesmaids think that this is going to slightly reinvent the wheel did you did you have that sense or was it just another day at the office it was you? i mean it was it was weird it was to us, we just want to make a funny movie, and it, I was just excited because I could hire all these really funny women. And I, you know, I, yeah, I definitely had not been happy with the way women have been portrayed, especially in comedy, for years and years and years. You know, they were just always, you know, either just, you know, the, a foil or a, you know, the person getting in the way of the funny guy or warm you know. props. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. like the shrewish girlfriend or whatever. You know, and um, so, so that was exciting to me. But then. Yeah, it was just like, let's just make a funny movie that we can all relate to. Um, but then it was more that the town started talking because a lot of female writer friends who were so inspired that we were doing this that they kind of saw, oh, good, there's going to be, we can make more female-led movies because it was really hard to get a female-led movie made. It, you know, it It's gotten better, but it's still not the first, you know, it's not the default setting of, of, of Hollywood still. Mm. Um, and so... They would tell me, like, they'd go out and pitch a, a movie, and the executives would say, well, okay, well, we got to wait and see how Bridesmaids does. 
So then the Senator's like, oh, my oh, God. I'm sure of that. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Also, it's, that just shows how stupid the town is, though. Yeah. Yeah, because it's not like, you know, when they're making the hangovers, like, oh, hold, don't pitch movies with three guys in it. Yeah. Because if that no more buddy well, movies, guys. We need to see how the hangover works. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because then we can't make movies with guys in it anymore. So, so yeah, it's so ridiculous. But, yeah, but you definitely start to feel that pressure. You know, but we put it together the way we'd normally do a movie and just tested it and, you know, made worked really hard on it. But then it was when we were going to open, that was when it was scary because then we were, I was told through Judd had heard through this, said the studio, I think the studio had said this to Judd that like if the movie didn't make $20 million or more on the opening weekend, it was going to be considered a failure. Which and I was just like, that's oh. the spirit, guys. I know. So I was like, oh god. It's, but I don't know. You know, you know, you make a movie, go like, well, maybe we'll make a hundred million dollars. I mean, we, I don't know. You know, but then tracking starts to come in. You know, what's tracking? What's tracking is basically where the they they just through a series of science that they have through movie theater owners and through polling and just talking to people on the streets, find out like if people are aware of a movie, how aware of it they are, what their interest in seeing it is. And so there's all this data that comes down. Like they have definite, you know, 10% of the people have definite interest in this. And it just goes down. So they scientifically can, it's so annoying because they basically go, they can tell you how much movie money your movie's going to make through the course of its life. And are they accurate with their predictions? There's, uh, they're many times annoyingly accurate. <laughs> Sometimes they're wrong, but more often than not, and so when you get that number, you're like, God damn it, really can't it be higher than that? <laughs> yeah, the simple favor was that. I was like, God, fuck you guys. You know, they're like, <laughs> it's going to make between 40 and $50 million of theaters. All the theater owners said like, how dare you? And then they made right around, they made like a little over 50. So, okay. But, um, but I remember getting the call that morning because they had done midnight shows um, that's the thing they do now. They do like the n- n- night before opening night, they'll do these advanced screenings and they kind of test the water through that. So, but this was a, a, a wedding movie. And so they did this yeah. midnight screening. Nobody knew. So it didn't do that well. So they're like, okay, it's going to make 13 million. So I remember getting this call from my agent. I was sitting on the toilet. I, I, I will. I hold nothing back. I remember getting this call on the toilet that morning. He goes like, it's going to be 13. I was like, oh, fuck, are you kidding me? And he's like, yeah. In a way, you're in the perfect place. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so I was just despondent all day. Just walking around like, God damn it. We, you know. And it, it, also that feeling of like, I guess now women don't get to make movies, <laughs> be in movies anymore. Yeah, what did you say? You're the, yeah, you, you're the... <laughs> the one that they're going to hang everything on. It's too much responsibility. So yeah. they said 13 million for your opening weekend. Yeah, 13 in the morning. But then, so, you know, walking around in a haze and then kind of come mid-afternoon, they're like, well, actually, it looks like it's going to be like 15 million. Like, oh, that's still not good. And then, but then the calls kept coming in like every hour. Like, well, it's actually, they're thinking 17 million now, you know? And, and then, because these afternoon shows were doing really well. And, um, then I had Melissa McCarthy and her husband Ben Falcone come to our house because they live in the neighborhood and we're friendly, and said, so "Just let's just come over for dinner and we'll kind of, you know, commiserate or see how the night goes." And as we were at dinner at our house, text started coming in like, "It's actually gonna be nineteen. It's gonna be twenty. It's gonna be twenty one. It's gonna be twenty two. You know." And suddenly it was gonna be like twenty four million, and we were just like, "Oh my god!" So we like get in the car. So we all got in the car and drove down to the ArcLight Theater in in Hollywood and walked into this packed theater that was just like rocking and just uh, every laugh was huge and we were just like oh we just, uh, it was the greatest turned into like the greatest <laughs> day of my life that, but that it's i mean obviously I, I don't know much about the 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 process of directing a movie but the fact that you're getting almost real-time updates yeah. from money men about how your your film is projected to to be doing as yeah. extraordinary oh it's crazy but you know then the opposite side is you know if, if it's not doing well the calls suddenly are gone, you know. I mean, that happened with with Ghostbusters. Is uh, you know they were uh, uh, the, the head of marketing or whatever was called. Okay, well, it's looking it looking like it might. You know, they they wanted it hit sixty million on, on an opening, o- opening weekend. weekend. Yeah, okay. because it was an expensive movie. And you know, I really thought we could too. Um, but you know, he's okay. It's looking like we're going to get hit there. And then I got a report from somebody else of like it's actually looking like it's going to be more like the high forties. And then. Nobody ever called me again. And what did it do in the end? What was it? It ended up having a forty-six million dollar opening weekend, which which was not enough for you know. It was my biggest opening, but it wasn't you know wasn't enough for 
the budget but that it we, re- we carried. It, but it recouped. Presumably, they they wanted to get certain multiples of their budget yeah, back. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's not about breaking even ever, ever is it? No, no, <laughs> no. It actually, I mean, theatrically, it did. It lost money. But then, did it? yeah, yeah, it did. It, we it, we it, foreign, we didn't do well. It was it was. But we, it we grossed like two hundred eighty eight million or something. Or something like yeah, we no, we were more sure. like, uh, like two hundred thirty million or something. Okay. But you know, our budget was like one hundred and forty million or something. So you know, you you have to double it. So yeah, it, it, you know, but look, I'm I'm sure they've made money back now with all the other mar- ancillary markets as they call them. <laughs> and, you know, DVDs and all that stuff. You know, and I'm hugely proud of it. But we just had you know. There was just so much bad press about us just, you know, for two years leading up to the movie because of all the, you know, the outrage on the internet. Well, you, and how you, dare you've we. taken their sacred artifacts. Yes. The, 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 you know, the sacred things yes. of childhood. Who knew? Who knew that, uh, that it meant so much? <laughs> I don't think they knew it meant so much. No, no. They were entitled to a reactionary opinion having yes. not seen it. Yes, God forbid that we put girls in their movie. Yeah, I mean, um, did that... I mean, we've we've talked about that before. We talked about how freighted that that movie was with all kinds of sort of toxic response. Mm-hmm. A lot of it sort of racist and misogynistic and possibly mm-hmm. homophobic in mm-hmm. in nature. What you know, you're a you're a well mannered gentleman. I mean, having that bombardment of pure fury must have been pretty tough. It was tough, especially, you know, it, it, growing up as a bullied kid, you know, you kind of go, oh, I'm an adult now. Now the bullying stops. And it had stopped for a long time. I had, I always had this really nice relationship with the with the internet because of Freaks and Geeks. And yeah. Bridesmaids. Because you're and, one of them. And you're, yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm a nerd like you guys. Yeah, exactly. And um, so I, I just wasn't prepared for for what I got hit with. You know, for that that much bile coming at me because I, you know, I, again, I, I every time I announce a project, oh, everybody's all happy. So this one's like, hey, I'm gonna do you know, Ghostbusters. I do it with hilarious women. That's who I'm gonna call. And you know, the first day is kind of all the responses are coming and people are excited and happy. Yeah. And that and then the next day, it then it get, went out to all kind of the, the 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 portals that would be outraged and just within a day my Twitter feed just turned into hell <laughs> and I just wasn't prepared for it like now it wouldn't wouldn't throw me because I've been through it and but I've how s- awful though that you're sort of inured to it now that you can take a oh no terrible a level of abuse yeah but you all of us we all get yeah. it. I mean and it, 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 you know the, the, the internet is sort of the best thing and the worst thing that ever happened to mankind yeah. you know and I'm glad we have it because it, it, it you know it's really connected us so much but it just it just makes every voice equal which yay yeah. people but at the same time not so yay sometimes because there's some really really scary people out there and also people just the, you know, the most boring uh, human emotion right now away from needing it for to make real change in society is outrage yeah. you know legitimate outrage is great but there's so much just wasted outrage that it's just so boring i mean people Anything you put up, somebody's going to get outraged about something, and it's so dumb. I mean, you know, having gone through the Ghostbusters thing, look, I get it. I'm I'm very, you know, religious about my favorite movies and all that. But at the same time, like to get death threats about a movie about funny people catching ghosts, like that no one's ever se- that hadn't people hadn't seen at that point. Yeah, I mean, it's theoretical outrage, isn't it? It's not yeah. it's not based on fact or evidence. It's not having gone to a movie theater and my childhood's destroyed thanks to Paul Feig. Yeah, exactly. It's, exactly. It's, still, it's just it, they've they've got a bit of news come through their social media feed yeah. and their. They've connected through their tribal affiliations to yeah. a sense of rage that right. How women, dare women, you. yeah, to a, to a notion they've been fed about women taking over the world yeah. and you know the white man. There's no room for us anymore, and all this shit. Yeah, it's just, just. I always encourage people who go down that road to just, you know, we. I don't know. It's the same in the states, but we do a census here, which tells you exactly the demographics of your local region, and just, right. just, just. Any time someone goes, we're being overrun, just just go and click on that. Yeah, yeah, you know, and just, yeah. This is a factual document produced by our unelected government, and yeah. it will tell you we're not being overrun. Well, that's I mean, it's just fear mongering. Well, totally. You know, I, I'm a big, big Richard Dawkins fan. You know, and I always he would talk about how the brain, you know, the human brain is kind of can't comprehend large numbers. Mm. You know, j- because it's just it's outside of our scope. And yeah. That's exactly what you're talking about. Like, you know, that that's the problem with the internet too. Is that 
you know, you open up your feed and like, oh my God, the world's against me. I, you know, and you're like, well, that's like a hundred people. But to us, it's that's all you can yeah. see. You know, it's totality, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. you're absolutely right. Yeah. And that idea of people. Um, if you because you like this, you'll like this. Yeah. That's how people are finding their social groups as mm-hmm. well. It's like okay, we're 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 a crew, yeah. and because we hate this, we hate this, yeah. and they're mobilized, and then they. But I, I, it's interesting. I suppose people wouldn't think you know you were an extremely articulate, successful writer, director, performer. <laughs> people wouldn't think that you could be destroyed over your cornflakes by a, a random, but you can. Oh, you, you know, I mean, it's yeah. like you can get a, a, a thousand compliments and one person says something mean and that you just obsess on that. Yeah, that's, that's the why, day. Yeah, and I go, and that's what, those are the moments I go like, is the internet really a good thing? You know, or at least, at, at least social media, let me say it that way, um, because of that. But I mean, that, that was the, the mistake I made during <laughs> during the lead up to, to, to Ghostbusters coming out was I I always had this thing about like I will never block anybody I want to read everything I, if somebody has a problem this and that I want to know all of it and so so that was me you know for the two years leading up to or three years leading up to Ghostbusters really was just just reading endless amounts of just was bile. it that long two years for two years in advance you were yeah, like yeah yeah because I mean it was yeah because I announced it. Yeah, I guess it was two years from when I announced it to when the movie came out. Oh, man. And then, you know, then after that. Um, you know, and so would read all this stuff, and it just would knock you down and knock you down. And my big mistake was there was some guy in outside of London um, who just was my main tormentor. And he only had like 96 followers, but he would just, and he just got under my skin and under my skin so badly. And finally, I was on vacation after we had uh, wrapped production on on, Go- on, on Ghostbusters and, and filming on it. And I'd been so good the whole time just being positive and putting out all this stuff. And this, he got me at this one moment. I'd had some wine. I was sitting with my wife in this beautiful setting. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to tell this guy to go fuck yourself. And I typed this thing at him and like, you know, basically like, fuck you. And um, much more, more uh, er, er, erudite, erudite. <laughs> there were that. adverbs in there and everything. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, there's actually <laughs> sentences. But, and I, like, my wife had gone to the restaurant, she came back, and, and she goes, like, why are you smiling? I said, like, I feel so good, I finally got it off my chest. And she's like, should you have done that? And the other is immediately like, let's damage limb yeah, limitation then. totally. I'm like, don't worry, no, this is great. And then, then like, I got an email from Judd, like, hey... I don't think you should have done that. And I was like, nah, this guy's been up my ass, blah, blah, blah. You know, he, he represents all these people. And then, of course, it was a disaster because basically, you know, it's, do you ever watch uh, professional wrestling mm. here? You know, it's always like the guy, come, the most powerful guy comes out and he's like, ah, I know this. And then they, they hit him with a chair and then he's like on the ground like, oh, I'll hurt. And, you know, and he can't get up. And that's the, what the what the the mean community online is, is like they can fire you, fire at you. The minute you fire back, oh my God, we're They'll claim victims. power dynamic. How yeah. dare yeah. you? Yeah. How you monster. And that's, you know, so that's I, I now I, anybody involved in, in a big project like this, I'm always like, don't respond. Don't respond. But, it, but then, but yes, I mean, that's very frustrating because you're not allowed to have a human response. You have mm-hmm. to have this sort of yeah. The corporate, the yeah. corporate yeah, line, great. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and what do you do? I, sp- I mean, some people, I suppose, just don't uh, turn, don't have social media accounts. Or, but yeah. but I suppose uh, when but you, you say to. that, yeah, you do. But yeah. also, for you, you're still in that movie theater, looking around at the audience, laughing at animal crackers, yeah. and you still want to know what everyone thinks. That's why you screen, t- test screen. That's why exactly. you. And the guy outside London who's raging. Yeah, there's a part of you that wants him to be. You want him to be happy. Totally. Oh no, totally. You want him to laugh at your jokes. Yeah, because then I start going through their feed. What do they like? Oh, yeah, this though. I like that stuff too. So why are they mad at me? You know. What is that? Why, why do we obsess over the people that hate us and, and not spend enough time with the people that love us? Because that's why we're in the business. We're people this, pleasers. I mean, this is what this is why we do comedy all the time. We're fucked up. <laughs> yeah, we're totally fucked up. But it's like it's like we're trying to convert people who have a natural antipathy towards us to 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 yeah. what the cult of us. We're not. Narcissistic nightmares. <laughs> totally. Well, that's all. But again, not being able to comprehend numbers. It's always when I'm like driving through a city or flying somewhere, and I look down and you just see all these, you know, towns and stuff, and you go, "Why do I care about one person?" You know, it, it's you know, it's a, dro- it's not even a drop of water. It's just, mm. but 
that's that's my problem with social media is it makes everything seem as important as the other thing. And, and, and again, but look, we're in a commercial business. Like, I'm not a painter. You're like, all right, make a painting. I don't care if you like it or not. Like, I'm making commercial movies. You know, studios are entrusting me with millions and millions of dollars. Yeah. I got to deliver the goods, and I got to make sure that we can hit as many people and make as many people happy as possible. That's what we. That's why I'm obsessed with these test screenings, because, you know, it's very democratic, I, I, or representative, I should say, because... And people are like, well, just one audience, what do they know? If you recruit people off the street, you know, the way that they do it and get the demographics and all that stuff, you get a pretty good sense from w- one theater filled with 400 people who don't know each other what what 4 million or 40 million people are going to respond. Yeah, it's it's weird that because I, I would have said you can't extrapolate from a, from a particular region, but you, you've always said, yeah, that it's actually, that America's pretty culturally cohesive and that you can kind of yeah. work out what the whole entirety of the nation's going to think. Yeah, no, that's why, they can, pocket. that's why they can call an election after like 1% of the votes have been tallied because they just kind of, it just... It rolls out. Yeah, you know, occasionally you hit a thing where, like, oh, there's a pocket of this, this and that, but, you know, for our purposes... You know, Sometimes we're like, oh, screw that. You know, especially if there's something you go, I know this works. Like something's yeah. like, well, maybe, but I'll just, then I'll go, well, let's just test it again. But if we do it in front of like two or three audiences and it doesn't work, I'm like, get it out of there. Because for some reason, something's not right about it, you know, or something's not working. You're, I know you're writing a, a, a monster movie. Can I say that? Yeah. yeah I'm so, so it, excited about this. I you. love a monster movie. <laughs> yes. But is it good to be back at the desk and scripting again i mean i know you've 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 obviously written films and co-written films mm-hmm. but there's got to be such a sense of freedom and control you know yeah it, altering I, your own well but, but once i once i finish production on the movie i'm usually like ready to go back into just managing myself you know because the movies you're just working with so many people and it's great it's so much fun but you know there is something nice about it, then the writing you get there but then once i'm writing then i'm always like you know, okay, I want to get back to you. I, ne- I never want to be doing what I'm doing, is basically what it is. But I think that's the creative brain, isn't it? It's just yeah. distracted and uh, always just delighted by the other. And doesn't, yeah. you know, I'm the same. I don't want to sit on my own and write, and yet that's all I want to do when I'm suddenly on a, mm-hmm. you know, on a show and everyone's chatting down my ear or, you know, whatever they're doing, you know. Yeah, totally. And, yeah. Uh, um, when you, I mean, I know you like, there's sort of every genre needs to get the fig treatment. Yeah, but, um, working my way through. We discussed a musical. I would love to see you do a musical. Oh, that's one of my things I'm dying to do. That's that's the that's probably the genre I'm the most uh, desperate to, to, to do and do right. Um, but I just want to, it's got to be really good and it's got to be unique and I'd like it to be an original musical. Yeah. I, I don't. I'm not really drawn to doing like kind of a pre-existing one, unless something popped up that I'm not thinking of. But um, yeah, I, 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 the idea of doing an original musical would just be so much fun. And I've, you know, we've. My company, I've been developing one for, for a while now. We've never quite got it right. And now I don't know if I want it to be that. I might want it to be a little bigger in scope. I, 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 just, I like spectacle. Yeah, you know, Busby Barkley. Yeah, 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 and color. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. That's what I love about this new movie, the, the, the Last Christmas, because it just it's it's just fun to look at, you know. Because we just showed off London so beautifully, and it's Christmas time, so all these beautiful it colors. Does look incredible. It, it's really pretty. It's a very pretty. It's a pretty. It's the prettiest movie I've made, and, and I really I like that uh, about it. But they, but I, that's what I want with a musical, you know. That's my wife uh, Lori, who you know, is uh, obsessed with Bollywood, as you know. Yes. And um, but I love watching those movies. I, I I love them. I like I like those movies a lot. But what I love are those the musical numbers, the dance numbers, because yeah. they're just so fun to look at, and they're so they shoot them so great, and the colors and the dancing is so fun, and they just they I don't think anybody shoots musical numbers as as well as uh, Bollywood. It's the scale, isn't it? It's yeah. just the fact they will put you know two three hundred bodies in the you know in perfect synchronicity, in yeah. beautiful saris, and oh, it's yeah. And the music is fun. And, yeah, you know, it's very dance music, you know. And it's, there's a sort of campness to it. There's a sort yeah. of a which I said to you was sort of abandonment. You know what I mean? It's like yeah, yeah we're just having fun and no one's kind of side-eyeing or being sort of wry about it. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that's that's the feeling I want to get. But, but what's great about Bollywood movies too is, I, I, there's some quote that somebody said, I can't remember what it is. It's, the, the, the gist of it is like, a, a Bollywood movie is like just watching life. You know, because it's like, 
they start out, they're really funny and they're corny and then suddenly they're super heavy yeah. and they're crazy emotional and then they're light again. And it's, I like that. I really like kind of that roller coaster ride of emotion. I find that really fun. If you do it right and it doesn't, you know, just become like maudlin and then, but if there's a way to kind of keep that all in there. I mean, that's what I love about comedy is, you know, I never am drawn to do like straight comedy. I, 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 I consider my movies to be kind of dramas that are funny, <laughs> you know, because you need to make sure that that, the characters and the storyline yeah, and all that stuff mean something. You can't just go joke to joke. The, we'll talk about Last Christmas, which is coming out on November the 15th. Here, 15th in the here. 8th in, uh, in the US. Which is your love letter to London, which is a place that yes. uh, you love and loves you back. Yeah. And yeah, your yeah. three piece suits are a perfect adornment. <laughs> the only place I don't look like a weirdo. <laughs> <in here>. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, I mean, that has a lot of social conscience to it it's a movie which is feels very rooted in the politics of of now so a slight slight departure yeah well i mean you know the brilliant emma thompson uh, wrote it and uh, brian brian kimmings uh, worked on the script and um yeah it's really got a quite a social conscious because uh you know george michael whose music is featured in the movie uh was kind of involved in the very beginning because he emma had talked to him about it because the idea was he had come up like oh, make a movie based kind of loosely on the on the song last christmas Christmas. And when she was talking to him about it, he would, you know, he said like, oh, you know, I wish I could kind of include something about the homeless problem and all that, because that was a big, yeah. big issue for him. And so that's in there. So it's, so it's, it's kind of, it's got a lot of people, a lot of good people's good intentions are in it. And, um, and it's just very sweet, yeah. But it's it's different. It's not a it's not a hard comedy like I, I tend to do. Um, is more, I mean, Simple Favor was really fun for me, my previous movie, because oh, yeah. it was, a, again, a genre. I'm having more fun doing movies that that don't, that aren't supposed to be comedies. <laughs> you know what I mean? Even though this, I mean, last There's Christmas pressure, is, is kind of supposed to be. Because it's, yeah, it, it it's, un, I like to surprise people with comedy, you know, and um, that's, with Simple Favor was so much fun, they kind of go, we, you know, we really marketed it like a thriller, wasn't a mistake. Maybe we should have put more comedy in the marketing. I don't know, but um, you know, you go, oh, I, oh, I know what this movie's going to be. And then, so when the, something funny happens, you're like, oh my god! But it comes out of character. It's not like suddenly somebody you know farts or put you know gets hit in the mm -hmm. face with a pie, you know. But it's it's behavioral where you're like, oh god, that's funny. Like you know, this nerdy woman, she's so odd. And then, oh my god, this you know other woman so brash and bold yeah. and all that. And the comedy comes from that. That's really fun for me. And then and that's why. Um, this one was nice, although this one, I think, has more of a feel of, like, you go, oh, it's a romantic comedy, so you come in expecting it's going to be sort of light and fluffy, and then you get a whole second and third layer with this movie, which is which is really nice. But I think we balanced it. I feel like we balanced it really nicely. So that's out November 15th. 15th, yeah, in, in the... In the uh, and when can we expect monsters? I'm obsessed with monsters. I know, me, me too. Uh, assuming my writing goes well, <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping to get that in production, you know, early next year and shoot it here in London. I'm writing it for London. So. By which time you'll be hopefully a full-time resident. Yes, that is my goal. That is our goal. My wife and I want to be full-time Londoners. So I, I, if you'll accept us, London. Uh, I can't speak for all of London, only a tiny <laughs> grey corner of the southeastern part in which uh, I was born. But God, <laughs> you are so... Th what a wonderful addition. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Fingers Paul. crossed. Thank you, Sue. You're the best. A total pleasure. Uh, you're a darling. You're one of my favourite people on the planet. Likewise. Right yeah. back at you. Thanks. Love and thanks to the magnificent Paul. Uh, Last Christmas is out in the States on the 8th of November. It's out here in the UK on the 15th. Uh, if you have a review of this podcast, then why not post it at Apple Podcasts? And if you have a track that you'd like us to play as the opening soundtrack, whether it's something that you've made yourself, whether it's something you've found, whether it's something you think just deserves a wider audience, then why don't you email me at sue at audioboom.com. All I do Stare at the view I'll be heading east To find my peace Where the desert feet